Gen X Grown Up is a YouTube channel website and audio podcast you're listening to right now. All made for and by people who love exploring media, games, tech, and toys of yesterday and today through the eyes of Gen Xers who refuse to grow up. Your dinner cannot just be french fries. Basically, life sucks as a grown up. Hey there, fourth listener. Welcome to the Gen X Grown Up podcast episode number 14. I am John. Joining me as always is George. Hey, how's it going, guys? And Mo is here. Hey, everybody. We have a lot of great stuff to talk about, but always the first thing I love to do is to read a little bit of listener email from our fourth listener. This week, we have email from Small Pocket Pear, and he writes in and says, (laughs) sorry, just the name. (laughs) I hear you talk all about your collections and have seen them on your YouTube channel when you do videos. First, how did you start your collection? What was your first piece of your collection? Do you have a standout piece? And finally, where do you get your items for your collection? Oh, jeez. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, it assumes that we only have one collection. We've got like 500 collections. Maybe he means your collection of junk. (laughs) I'm going to try to answer this first. I'm going to assume that Small Pocket Pair just means our collection of stuff in general, our nerdy stuff. So my nerdy stuff consists, of course, of, you know, game stuff and toy stuff and tech stuff. When I first start my collection, when I was a kid, I mean, some of the stuff I have is stuff that I had still when I was a kid. So uh, I never stopped my collection. It certainly atrophied a bit when uh, we all go into that yard sale phase and a bunch of your $6 million man crap gets sold off. But a lot of stuff I still kind of have. Yeah, it was the first piece. Couldn't tell you. No idea. (laughs) No idea. Standout piece. I mean, for me right now, by far the standout piece has to be the ET cartridge from El Gordo. That was a a one of a time collectible. Yeah, it's just an amazing thing to have. Where do I get my items from? I mean, that's another broad question. Anywhere I see stuff. (laughs) Flea market yard sales, eBay, (laughs) Amazon, you know, whatever. Neighbors' houses, you know, anywhere. (laughs) That's right, yeah. (laughs) The collection is not a like, let's go to the collecting place. If you're collecting crap like this, you know, you've always, you always got the collecting radar going and you're like, oh, there's a thing, you know, you attract you wherever you're at. Mo, how about you? I mean, when I was younger, I collected comic books since like relinquished my collection over to my daughter who's now collecting comic books. But yeah, kind of like you, I'm not really sure. I mean, I just sort of, if something I think is cool, I'll get it. So I can't really think of anything that's like a first thing or anything that's really kind of a standout. It's kind of a broad series of questions there, Small Pocket Pair. How about you, George? I'm like you. I I started collecting when I was young, but I had kind of a different journey. So I played a lot of sports, as you guys know, and everything. So I collect a lot of baseball cards and things like that when I was probably in the six to eight year old range. But even before that, Mm -hmm. my mother has told me stories where apparently I used to love getting a hold of any kind of electronics of the day, calculators or whatever I could find, and tearing them apart. Tearing that stuff up. So is that really collecting (laughs) or vandalism? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) A couple of days ago, my mother found a device. She was looking on Facebook, and there was some video talking about an old electronic device. And she's like, we used to have that for George. I'm going to go find it in his old toy box. So it was a Mr. Wizard little owl calculator device, but it's not a calculator. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It mm-hmm. gave you math problems, and then you had to solve them, and then it would tell you yep. how many out of 10 that you got right. That was my first collectible. Yep. So now that it's come back to me, it's the thing that I'm focused on. I would say <laughs> nice. that my standout is my first printings of issues number two through five of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. There's kind of a broad cross section of uh, our collection <laughs> habits and history. Thanks so much for writing in, Small Pocket Pair. We always love hearing from our fourth listener. Keep the emails coming and we'll keep responding right here on the show. Cobra's still in our plans. He's escaping in the Viper Glider. Jump! The G.I. Joe Falcon Glider Flying high in the sky Sailing through the air He's America's fighter G.I. Joe can fly Time to get caught up on our media consumption, TV, movies, and music. There was something I was looking forward to during our last podcast, a Netflix series. I caught, and Mo, I know you caught it too, that Altered Carbon, right? Yeah, it caught my eye because it kind of gave me kind of a Blade Runner-y kind of feel. Oh man, it has a Blade Runner vibe, wow. okay. no doubt. So I was pretty excited about that. The premise of it I thought was pretty interesting. You know, it's just like not giving anything away, but it's essentially they store your consciousness on a piece of hardware that's in your neck. Yep. And if your body dies, they could just simply put it into another body, you're back. Wow. Yeah. You never die. So you're downloaded to an SD card. Essentially, yeah. Yeah, unless you get shot in the neck. <laughs> Very Blade Runnery kind of look, kind of a cyberpunk mm-hmm. thing. The coolest extra tech that I didn't realize uh, when he got into the show was the super rich guy who got resurrected, who hired the dude. Yeah, to solve his own murder. He's rich enough that he backs up his consciousness every like 48 hours to a satellite oh, orbiting the Earth. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So he was killed by being shot in the neck, but because he had been backed up several hours earlier, the consciousness that was restored, that's why he doesn't know who. <laughs> 
who killed him. Right, he has no memory of that. He doesn't have any memory of his last day. They do a good job too. It's like the world has become like a two class system. Yeah. Because really, like the people who can like do clones and blah blah are only the ultra wealthy. Right. So they're essentially immortal for all intents and purposes. So pretty much today, just with clones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. But because they're clones, you know, they've been around for like hundreds of years, so their power just continues right. Yeah, because they just continue to collect wealth and power. And yep. I read a little article about the show that for some people might be an impetus to watch. For some people, it might turn them off. There is what some people would consider a lot of gratuitous nudity, and especially the first few episodes. That was intentional. One of the core concepts of the series is that there's a disregard for the body now because right. you aren't oh. your body anymore. You are this stack okay. that lives in your neck. And so people aren't hung up about their body because it's not really them. Right now, we identify you know, our body with us. That's my face. That's, you know, that's my body, my arms, my legs, right. you know, my goonies. Wow, okay. <laughs> in this future world of of, uh, altered carbon that's not the case. It's like the suit you're wearing. Yeah, they don't even call them bodies. They call them sleeves. They're sleeves. It's sleeves. just the thing that my wow. consciousness is in right now. Yeah, you slip it on. I've caught this just the first episode. Mo, how much have you uh, gone through? I'm a little over halfway. Man, you have plowed through it. You're enjoying that gratuitous nudity, aren't you? <laughs> well, there's, I think, 10 or 12 episodes or something like that. So I got through the, yeah, I got through all the nudity scenes and then, you know. It pumped the brakes. It <laughs> lost its luster. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay, they're done with that part. smoked a cigarette, came back. The theme of, like, your body <laughs> being unimportant. Yeah, it's definitely an overarching theme. That was one of the questions I had because I haven't watched the series yet, although I knew it had to be phenomenal because not only did I hear about it from the two of you, uh -huh. I had like four people at work telling me I needed to put this in my list of things to watch. Yeah. I'm curious to know though, there's a big disregard for the body. What about the legal ramifications with that? <laughs> in our legal society now, that would be a whole big issue as to property rights and- They touch on a lot of that. Actually, that's another theme. Like the ultra wealthy, they show their kids are just like total decadent because they have no reason to grow up. Oh. Uh Oh. There's nothing to inherit because their parents are going to live forever. So speaking of stuff on Netflix... George, there was something that you probably caught that has been out for a few months now. The Dungeons and Dragons cop buddy movie, well, right? Well, yeah. <sighs> I know that there's a lot of people out there who <laughs> panned this movie and didn't like it, but it's with Will Smith. It's called Bright. Yep. I personally enjoyed it. I don't have to go into every TV show, every movie, finding some deeper meaning and being enlightened in some way. I can just sit and enjoy something. Granted, this thing was totally ham-fisted mm -hmm. with its mm -hmm. racial overtones and I hate driving through Elf Town. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I didn't like it. Fair enough. And my reason for not liking it, I think I have no problem suspending belief. I could believe that we could build giant robots to fight giant monsters. I could totally go with that. <laughs> you better hope so. That movie's coming out. <laughs> this one, I think, just asked me to just accept too much. Like, why the frick were there elves to start with? What happened with the orcs in the past that everyone hates? All you know is that they did something and now everyone just hates them. There's just so much, like, no backstory well, that you I mean, just got to They do kind of bring accept. the backstory into it later on. They don't feed that information to you up front. It's not until the second second or even third act when you start learning a lot of that backstory. They certainly throw you right in the middle of the world with kind of no swim fins. I mean, you're supposed to yeah. jump right in. Yeah. I will say that I didn't finish this movie. I think I watched it about yeah, two thirds of the way through or so. And I didn't stop watching it for, I think, some of the reasons that people are panning it. The thing that I really just found didn't grab me was the writing and parallels between like the different races in this mystical world and our own race relations. It was so on the nose. Yeah, it was very ham yeah. It wasn't even allegory. It was like, search for X, yeah. replace with Y. And Star Trek used to do a great job of doing like social commentary, but it was kind of like, oh, I didn't notice I was being shown a morality tale. Like black, white, white, black guys. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Let this be your last yeah. battlefield. I would have liked a Dungeons and Dragons meets a buddy cop movie, but it, I didn't feel like that. I felt like it was another movie that just had this painted on top of it. So. I know that I'm probably going to be the one out of 1500 people that enjoyed it a little bit, but <laughs> I, I appreciated the effort at least. I didn't hate it. It just didn't grab Own me it, and I George. had so much Own other it. stuff to watch. <laughs> it sounds to me like you kind of bought in a little faster than kind of most people maybe did. Sure. You kind of maybe got more out of it because you weren't resisting. Yeah, I had none of the preconceived hate that it seems that a lot of people <laughs> had for this film. Well, good news for you and questionable news for everybody else. It has already been greenlighted for a sequel. Has it really? It really has. So uh, <laughs> I want to talk about one more thing before we jump out of the media segment of the show. And you know how much I love documentaries and how much I love arcade games. <laughs> I found this documentary from I think it was 2012 or so called Space Invaders in Search of Lost Time. No, really. A documentary about Space Invaders? So what arcade game was this about? Exactly? It's not about Space Invaders. That's the name of it. Space Invaders refers to how much space arcade cabinets take up 
in the homes of people who collect them. Oh, <laughs> nice. Okay. So the documentary is all about people who were huge fans of the arcades growing up in the 80s. And they when they realized, I can own these. And they buy one and they buy two and they buy 30 and they buy 80. And it's consuming their homes. And then they end up starting up the Daytona Arcade Museum. Yeah, some of them do. <laughs> uh, some of them build a second garage. Some of them build another basement or buy a new house or whatever. <laughs> it follows five or six of these guys and their families. It's a low budget production, but I didn't care. It's uh, oh, it was wow. fun to see because just to see these guys talk about why they collect them and struggles they've gone through with the homeowners association because trucks coming in and out of the <laughs> neighborhood and it's pretty cool. If you can find it, um, I think I spotted it on Amazon. You can probably go there and find it. I was able to find a copy, but Space Invaders in Search of Lost Time is a pretty cool documentary to check out if you have any interest in the stuff that Gen X grownups like us do. Oh, I'm absolutely going to check it out. Sidewinder, the wheels twist behind. It's the big new Sidewinder cycle. Your parents put it together, and Sidewinder's got the stun shifter. Sidewinder. And we're on to the world of games, something that we all kind of enjoy just a little bit. Give or take. Give or take a little bit. John, you got any <laughs> games that you've been checking out or anything you've found oh, new? Oh, man. I have three quick topics to touch on that I'm going to talk about in the gaming world. Three? three? Three. It's the John Show. Yay. I will accept your feedback on my topics if you like. Uh. <laughs> the first is talk a little bit about a live stream we did last Thursday. I did not expect it to tick off a bucket list item for me, but it did. <laughs> we did a stream about the very first first Easter egg in any video game that was in the uh, Atari 2600 cartridge adventure. Yes. That was written by Warren Robinette in yeah. Atari. Uh, and so we had the stream scheduled. We're going to yep. go through the stream. However, thanks to our brilliant marketing department, Woo, George, they were able to contact the author Warren Robinette and he was in the live stream with us. Yes, he was. That was cool. It was awesome to be able to not just show the Easter egg and do a live stream of it, but the author of the game that I played so many times growing up as a kid was part of kind of this tapestry history of my youth, the guy that wrote it was in there talking with us, answering questions. It was just, it was awesome. And frankly, he was super cool. I was a little flustered and didn't play incredibly yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, we noticed. <laughs> well, you're so kind not to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a guy who was texting me who was watching. He wasn't in the live chat, but he was texting me, a buddy of mine that I grew up with. I was lost in one of the mazes in the, the Black mazes. Dungeon, and he, yeah. and he texts me. It pops up <laughs> in the corner of my screen. He just says, dude. <laughs> <laughs> John, you're embarrassing us here, dude. <laughs> Performance anxiety aside, what an amazing stream. If you didn't see it, you can go back and still watch the archive of it. It's available. Yeah. It's the first ever Easter egg on adventure. Yeah, and, and look at the chat on that, especially because he was he answered every question. Hey, ignore my play. Look at the chat. Literally two minutes before we went live, I got his email saying, I'll be there. How long is this thing going to last? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not only did he show up, he was there the minute we started mm -hmm. and he stayed. stayed till we ended. Yeah. And we need to point out that he did talk about one thing that's on his upcoming horizons. He's writing a book about oh, yeah. his time at Atari, his creation of the adventure game, the whole reason for the Easter egg. So mm -hmm. if you guys want to go to his website, warrenrobinette.com. We'll put a link to his website down in the show notes below. We'll definitely have the show notes for that. Uh, briefly, the next thing I wanted to touch on of my three things. Last month we did that live stream for Containment, mm. that cool game by Finite Reflection. Yes. I just want to mention it's out now. It came out February mm -hmm. 9th. I got back into playing it again because it's one of those games that gets you in surges. You're like, you play it a bunch, you put it down for a while and you go, I gotta get back into that. Yeah, especially the high score part, right? Yeah, I jumped back in on launch day and on one of the levels I was able to get the top score ahead of Cardic, the developer. Couldn't believe it. <laughs> you got the score above the guy from Finite Reflections who programmed the game. I got a better score on one of the levels than the guy that wrote the level I was playing. Wow. Right. We'll see how long that lasts, <laughs> well, but still a great game. He can go into code and just change that, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I tweeted it to him and I said, hey, gotta get busy. <laughs> Actually, he needs to get busy working on Twin Cup. He yeah, got time to work no, on his high yeah. score. He needs to put the high score down and go to Twin Cop. Kartik, if you're listening, we need Twin Cop. So anyway, containment, a lot of fun. It yep. was on sale, actually 25% off the $2 for a buck fifty on launch day. It, so right. I mean, like... It's worth way more than that. Let me tell you, it, it's as cheap as an iPhone mobile game, and it's way better. <laughs> the last thing on my list of three that I want to talk about on gaming is not a video game, but a board game. Yeah. You might remember a few backtracks ago on the backtrack we did about classic board games... I said this. I like that, that we got to talk about talking about old board games. This is one that I never had. It was jealous a buddy of mine had. 
called Dark Tower. You remember this thing? That sounds familiar. I haven't played it, but I bet you I'd remember if I saw it. Oh, so let me describe Dark Tower. You have a quest where you have to work your way around the board. The thing I loved about it is it had this electrical dark tower that stood in the middle of the board. And the computer is what you played the game on. And if you had to fight, it would tell you how many brigands you had left and how many soldiers you had left. When you crossed into a new area or you moved into a new step or you went to a dungeon, the computer would tell you what happened. And the computer was rudimentary. It was a glorified calculator inside the tower. So uh, you have an update or something happened? I do have an update. Uh Uh-oh. I do have an update. Thanks to the kindness of a friend, I now own (gasps) a copy of Dark Tower. A working copy? I mean, it actually works. Is it a working copy? One owner, looks like maybe it got played half a dozen times. Impeccable condition. All the parts are there. A little wear on the box, but I mean, every little piece of packing material and warranty card and replacement bulbs. I played it once, and you might remember on the show that we talked about one of the reasons I wouldn't invest in buying one of these rare games is I was afraid once I got it, it wouldn't hold up like to my memory. Right. I played it last night. It's still fun. I want to play it again. <laughs> it may be more fun than I remember. There were parts of it that I'd forgotten. They have it on an Android app. You can play the game. But what's missing is you push that button and sometimes it just goes beep. Or sometimes you push the button and you hear the motor starts turning you're like oh shit what's it gonna do (laughs) having that mechanical entity in the middle of the board is just makes it that much cooler another one of my bucket list items the dark tower board game now lives in my home and a really good copy too that's awesome man i was honored that i was able to find it and give it to you uh you've been such a great friend and everything over the years that's true sure yeah Yeah, absolutely (laughs) (laughs) i totally deserved it that's right this game came out when i was 10 years old i thought i had owned it but it turned Turns out it was probably a neighbor from across the street, but playing the game with you, I don't even remember playing it before. Really? Yeah, I didn't have the memories of playing. I, re- I remember seeing You more just tower. remember its existence and seeing yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. And you're right, man. That motor spinning around, just two little numbers, you know, zero through nine. But they represent your life. Bulbs that go up and down on this little thing as it spins and it lights up these little pictures from behind and, you know, like brigands and... The wizard and the sword and the dragon and the curse right. and all the fun stuff. And then yeah. the sounds the sounds that it uses they're so spot on to what's happening at that moment man it was definitely living in the 80s all over again it was awesome the tower is just a little digital asshole dungeon master yeah (laughs) it was great he has no mercy can't wait to play it again so again george thank you and then to the rest of the world if you're about to ship me a dark tower i have one now thank you thank you very much that doesn't mean you you can can get another one because then i can have that one (laughs) fair enough if you're about to ship me a dark tower go ahead just mark it in care of george (laughs) Yeah, attention, George. (laughs) Rebo's got the beat, and the band plays on. You can relive it all with Kenner's Star Wars Return of the Jedi Collection. Introducing Size Noodles and the Rebo Band. Jabba the Hutt action playset sold separately. I love talking about uh, tech and toys that we enjoy playing with. George, you have something new that you wanted to chat about a little bit on the show, right? As you guys know, I'm not the early adopter guy in the group. I'm the guy who comes four or five years late and finds it in a bargain bin at Walmart. (laughs) So when I buy my tech toys, I make sure that it's something that has been proven, that has a bunch of reviews somewhere that I can trust. But I started getting into these podcasts, mainly because of us doing this one. Then I started listening to podcasts. I tried a couple of times to listen to the podcast, especially the longer ones. There's some podcasts out there that are 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. I can't listen to that on the drive. It's like a commitment to listen to those. You know, driving to my work is only like 20, 25 minutes. So if only there was a tech centric podcast that only ran about 20 to 30 minutes. Wow. You know, that would be the perfect length. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. You're listening to it right now. (laughs) (laughs) One day I was trying to listen to one of these long podcasts. I'd gotten home. I needed to go take a shower. I put my phone down. I turned the speaker on the phone all the way up. And I was like, okay, I can hear that. I got in the shower, closed the glass door, turned the water on and couldn't hear shit. (laughs) And I said, you know what? My son has one of these little Bluetooth speakers. Let me go see if I can borrow his. Getting ready to get out of the shower. I'm like, I'm a grown adult. I can afford one of these things, I think. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I went to Amazon. I searched through a couple of them, found the ones that had some better reviews. I found this one by Anchor. Mm-hmm. A-N-K-E-R. I've got a couple Anchor things. Sure. They had this little round Bluetooth speaker. They had a set of them, and that day they were on their lightning sale. Oh, yeah, okay. I just grabbed the little round one because I was like, well, I don't want it in the shower. I just want it on the little shelf 
near the shower. I bought the thing. It came in a couple of days later. Holy crap was this thing loud and not distorted at all. Yeah, surprising quality on some of these little things. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? What really got me was it had great bass sound in it. Mm -hmm. I was totally mm -hmm. shocked by that because this is mm -hmm. a small, like shorter and a little bit wider than a pepper shaker. Yep. It filled the room up at only like half volume. I couldn't be happier with this little thing. I bought a couple of their other products and I haven't been disappointed yet. So anchor line to you guys, whenever you're listening to this podcast, you want to start sending us stuff to review. <laughs> this little Bluetooth speaker blew me away. The stuff that's so good, it makes you angry. I think back to, you know, when I was a kid, my first 1977 Chevy pick up and I'm every other day tearing the dash open working on my right. stereo and <laughs> trying to get better bass response and right. putting giant speakers behind the all I had to do was get this little bullet shaped thing had better sound than my whole damn truck did back then <laughs> when I was in high school <laughs> that's the kind of tech stuff that just blows me away you kind of overlook it because it's everywhere but when you look at it objectively compared to like what we used to have those things are just amazing for and usually under 50 bucks right for mm -hmm. amazing sound that you can throw in your pocket yeah it was like $15 on that lightning sale or something stupid. like that stupid just yeah. stupid and again the fact that we're looking at it through the eyes of Gen Xers who didn't have this stuff all the time just makes it that much more cool absolutely now mo you got something you want to talk about is not exactly a piece of tech that you picked up and started playing with no but cool nonetheless i thought it was totally cool the falcon heavy launch that happened a few days ago from where i work the roof we could actually see the like the launch itself oh really you could see it yeah we could oh, see wow. the fire you know you could see this bright thing kind of going up across the sky for our listeners mo that don't know what the hell a falcon heavy is fill them in basically it's elon musk you know from tesla and all those other companies. He basically found an economic way to get large payloads into space. <laughs> you said payload. <laughs> no, I said payload. <laughs> the Falcon Heavy is the only rocket that we've ever made that's bigger was the ones that we sent the people mm. to the moon with. Like the ones we sent to the people on the moon was slightly bigger, but this is the next biggest rocket we've ever launched. This is the next largest, yeah, most powerful wow. one after that. And so the thing that was cool is like, this is like a, a test. So he said, generally, when you're testing rockets like this, you put some sort of weighted thing in the nose to kind of account mm -hmm. for the payload. And he had something to put into the payload, didn't he? Which was his personal Tesla car. <laughs> wow. The third one ever made. That's the best excuse to get a new car I've ever heard. Right? I know. And he put a mannequin in the driver's seat wearing one yep. of their spacesuits. His inspiration was heavy metal. That's got to be from heavy metal. Heavy metal movie. Yep. I was thinking yep. of that scene when I saw some <laughs> of the pictures on the internet. The part that just blew me away, though, is like the whole thing that makes it affordable is that the booster rockets are re reusable. Yeah, didn't they land or something? You can see like a parachute thing come down or whatever it is. No, these things come down end first. And they land. Before they hit the ground, rocket blasts, and it just sets down upright. They land themselves yeah. vertically. Vertically. It's like what our science fiction movies in the 60s told us rockets would land like. Right, yeah. But it actually is doing that. The first <laughs> yeah. time I saw it, I said, wait a minute. I said, why are we watching that the computer simulation they did? Sure. And it turns out it wasn't the computer simulation. It was the actual event. And the two rockets landed simultaneously. No, really? At the same time? Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. At the same time. And basically, his car is going to go past the orbit of oh, Mars. It, like, like it launched and left the car out there and yeah, didn't bring he, it back down? He's sending a Tesla to Mars. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yep. The Tesla's going to go to Mars. It's in this very, like, a long orbit around the sun, but its end is going to take it past Mars. It was just a cool, geeky thing. I'm always into anything space related I'm totally geek out over. Sure. So this was particularly cool. Class, what animal do you think of when I say honey? Frogs. Frogs. <laughs> because now I make honey smacks. Jiggle makes them honey smacking good. As always, we like to talk about what we're looking forward to between today and when the next episode of the podcast comes out. Mo, you have anything you're looking forward to? Yeah, there's a movie coming out February 23rd called Annihilation. It has Natalie Portman in it. Oh, the Natalie Portman film. Yeah. Not Mortal Kombat. <laughs> no, just Annihilation. That's all it's called. Okay. To be honest, <laughs> I have no freaking idea what this movie's about. I don't either. But the trailer, I'm like, this looks cool. I was going to ask, why are you looking forward to it if you don't know what it's about? <laughs> yeah, it's just because the trailer looked, basically all you know is that they walk into to this other gateway or whatever you want to call it in the middle of this woods and there was someplace else that the like laws of nature are different or something. Alternate dimension kind of thing sounds like. It made me think of like uh, Natalie Portman stars in What Dreams May Come Part 2. Oh. It was really kind of weird and surreal in a lot of ways. Okay, so not like stark sci-fi transitions but like the dream state No, it's thing. more like what are these cherry blossoms doing on this stone tree? Or oh. Why is these flowers okay. this big or something? Gotcha. Yeah, it was like what the hell's happening? Yeah, I'm intrigued by 
by that too. Do you know any more about it, Mo, or just what you've seen in the trailer? I just know the trailer, and then the basic premise is that her husband has disappeared, like investigating this phenomena, and so she's part of the expedition that's trying to find out what's happened. Oh, okay, all right. And that's about it. <laughs> that's all I know. <laughs> and when does that come out? Uh, February twenty third. I'm in. Cool. How about you, George? Anything you're looking forward to between now and the next show? Anything at all? Well, anything you have a vague interest in? Maybe. I mean. Okay, you guys know it's February. You know what's coming up. It's Walking Dead mid-season premiere, folks. Oh, boy. Walking Dead, by far, has been the thing I've been waiting for for the last two months. Or three months, I guess, really. It's all I live for, just about, it seems, when this time of the year So comes this around. is the mid-season it premiere, is. right? So this is like the halfway point, the, the holiday Man, break. Man, you want to talk about some withdrawal symptoms, some anxiety. Waiting for Walking Dead, it's just, it kills me every time. Walking Dead, February 25th, mid-season premiere. We're going to have some clashes between Negan and Rick. There was a big cliffhanger at the end. I, can I talk about the end a little bit? Because... Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's months old. <laughs> Go I know I had seen interviews from Kirkman saying that he would never kill off two characters. One of them being Rick Grimes, because Rick Grimes is our eyes into the world in his mind. The other character that he said he had no interest in killing off was Carl. His son. Right. Carl was the future of the world. It was going to be the hope for the world. Well, God damn it, Kirkman, if you didn't go back and change your mind. <laughs> They're sitting in the underground little sewer system below Alexandria. Grimes and Michonne walk up to Carl. They pull up his shirt sleeve and he's got a damn zombie bite mark. <laughs> so I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know if he's going to survive this zombie bite mark for a while or if they're going to cut off his arm. I mean, he's been sitting there for a while. So at this point, cutting off the arm doesn't make any sense. It seems like Kirkman has decided to kill off Carl Grimes. I have a feeling on the next podcast... This is going to be in the media section to talk about. Oh, you know it will. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, wouldn't it be a twist that it turns out that like he's immune or something? That would be a twist. It's dun, nothing. Dun, dun. The problem is everybody already has the virus in the Walking Dead world. So you can't be mm -hmm. immune mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. virus. It's just, are you maybe immune to all the bacteria that comes with a zombie bite mark? You know, it's a dead creature, right? And it's rotting and it's been chewing on other humans and stuff. So I'm guessing it's all the bacteria mm -hmm. in that bite that kills hungry. you. you some of those yeah. Taco Bell nacho fries now? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> fries. <laughs> Mo, what about you? What did you think about that Carl Grimes scene? You know, if they kill him off, actually, I think he's going to turn me off from the show. Really? Because basically he's saying, don't get attached to anybody. Yeah. Because also, I don't see the point of killing him either. Like, why? How does that advance the show at all? Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Love comic books? Then check out Parlapod, the podcast for die-hard fans. We've got interviews. Hi, this is Kelly Jones. Hi, everybody. This is John Semper. This is Ming Chen. Hey, this is Tim Seeley. Hey, folks. This is Brian O'Halloran. Hey, what up? This is Jason Mewes, and you're listening to Parlapod.com comic book podcast. Snooch to the news. Reviews. These covers are, are blowing me away. Ugh. So Concept is just too darn good. I wish they had done a better job with it. And all the comic book news you you need to know about. Mark Strong is in talks to play the villain, Dr. Savannah. All in, man. He was a great Sinestro, too. Available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and it's always free to download. Follow us on social media at Parlapod. Fresh episodes every Wednesday morning, just in time for your trip to the local comic book store. Parlapod. We are your source for everything comic book related. Give us a listen today. And that was another wonderful episode of the Gen X Grown Up Podcast. So modest. <laughs> yes. It was a wonderful episode because I'm back, uh, ladies and gentlemen. That's true. We get to talk about all kinds of stuff. Walking Dead, Walking Dead, Walking Dead. And we're going to put some of that stuff in the show notes. Get to click in and go find out all the stuff that we enjoyed ourselves. And so you don't miss any more episodes because they are all fantastic. Be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or whatever you use to get your podcasts. And while you're at iTunes, we really appreciate it if you would pop in there, search for Gen X Grown Up, up. Give us that five star rating and more importantly, write a little review. Those reviews really help. If you know someone that's as nerdy as all of us, tell them about the Genix Road Up podcast. We really would appreciate it. And in case you didn't notice, somebody told Small Pocket Pair about our podcast today and we made him famous by reading his podcast email. Internet famous. If you, you want to be internet famous, just like Small Pocket Pair, send us an email at podcast at genixgrownup.com. And don't forget to visit us on YouTube or on our website, which is genixgrownup.com. Guys, I appreciate so much you stopping in. We're going to be back 
in two weeks with another Gen X Run Up podcast, but next week with a backtrack. Our topic in that backtrack is going to be after school TV shows. Yay, nice. <laughs> We're going to talk about all those cool shows you would watch when you got home from school instead of doing your homework. <laughs> Sounds good. George, thanks so much for being here. Absolutely. See you guys next time. Mo, thanks for stopping by. I love it. Love it too, man. See you later. And listener, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. No life, no fun. Don't you know that you're a grown-up? No games, no puns. Basically, life sucks as a grown-up. This has been a production of the GWW Radio Network. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Also, check out Geeks Worldwide at the GWW.com for all the latest news, reviews, and opinions on video games, comics, movies, TV, cosplay, and more. Geeks Assemble! Three, two, one, zero. Zero. No, don't do a zero. God the damn it. Fuck? No, I gotta start over. Because of zero? Seriously? Right. We never do a zero. Well, it's first day on the podcast, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember my first podcast. We'll be fine. <laughs>